Hello again. Welcome to the James Swanick Show, soon to be renamed the Transformation Show with James Swanick, or it might just be like the Transformation Podcast with James Swanick. I sent out a survey to uh, many of my listeners and to people who read my uh, daily email, which you can get access to at jameswanick.com. And uh, overwhelmingly, people said Transformation was a really cool name rather than the James Swanick Show. Uh, so that's what we'll do. We're going to change it pretty soon in the next couple of episodes. The audio is going to be so much better in the next couple of episodes. I'm just waiting for a brand new uh, microphone that I ordered a couple of weeks ago but because uh, everything's taking a lot longer to get through the mail, especially because I'm in Australia at the moment and I ordered it from the US. Uh, it hasn't arrived yet, but it will, and the audio quality is going to be amazing. At the moment, I'm just recording this through my MacBook Pro. Um, enjoy this podcast episode with Keith Ferrazzi. Uh, I'll explain in the first few minutes uh, how I came to meet him. He's an he's a author of a New York Times bestselling book uh, called Never Eat Alone, which completely transformed the way that I look at relationships um, back in 2010. Uh, this was recorded on our virtual summit event um, about six weeks ago, and you'll hear a few people who were listening in live at the time. We had about 50, maybe 60 people um, present. You might be able to actually see the video recording of this over on my YouTube channel. I'm going to release it on my YouTube channel soon. YouTube channel is James Swanick one uh, And uh, do let me know how you found this uh, episode. Did you like it? Did you not like it? What would you like uh, to hear from me ongoing? Uh, send me a DM on Instagram, at James Swanick. Send me a Facebook message, uh, James Swanick Official. Uh, send me an email. My personal email address is james at jameswanick.com. Don't be a stranger. Just get in contact with me. Let me know if you're a long-time listener or a newish listener. I would love to hear from you. All right, let's get into today's episode with Keith Ferrazzi. I want to introduce everyone to a wonderful friend of mine uh, by the name of Keith Ferrazzi, who's just joined us. And on my view, I see him down on the bottom right on the first screen. But Keith, just give us a little wave there. Can you see it? There he is. And uh, Keith um, uh, is a friend of mine because of something that he wrote in his book. He wrote a book, and I think it was 2005, and I remember reading it when I was on a, a flight f- um, between Buenos Aires and Los Angeles uh, in early 2010 when I'd just been returning from six months in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I read this book that he wrote called Never Eat Alone, which is a New York Times bestseller. He's gone on subsequently to write another New York Times bestseller by the name of Who's Got Your Back. And this book, Never Eat Alone, <clears throat> fundamentally changed the way that I look at relationships. And I realized from reading this book that I was beginning each new relationship. And I don't mean a romantic relationship. I mean any relationship, platonic, um, a relationship with a colleague or a boss, a person serving me coffee at a, at a Starbucks. I realized I was going into each relationship thinking, what can I get out of this? As opposed to how can I help this person? It's not, I was thinking, how can this person help me versus how can I help this person? And it fundamentally shifted the trajectory of my life in the sense that each new relationship from that point on was one of looking at the relationship as how can I give rather than how can I take. And, uh, you know, it was only six weeks after returning from Buenos Aires and after reading that book that I got a job hosting Sports Center on ESPN, which was my dream job. And it was a result of implementing uh, the strategies that I'd learned in Keith's book. Uh, I had helped someone immensely um, a few weeks before I did my Sports Center audition, and it was that person who, who introduced me to an ESPN producer who then ultimately gave me an audition and then I ultimately got that job hosting a TV show. And so that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have given of, of myself first to my friend um, uh, as a result of reading Keith's book, Never Eat Alone. And so I actually stalked him for about three years trying to get his attention until finally I did. And then I flew to uh, Guatemala to uh, help out one of his uh, wonderful charities uh, uh, in Guatemala and uh, we got to meet in person and, and hang out there and then, um, you know, became friendlier over the years, I guess. And now I, I consider him a wonderful friend. He came to my birthday a couple of years ago in Venice Beach. We go five rhythm, da- five rhythm dancing together on uh, Saturday mornings in Venice Beach quite a lot. And uh, Keith's just become 
you know, just a great friend and a wonderful person and so giving. He helps uh, organizations all around the world, um, corporate America, helps them build teams, which has been able to drive revenue and profits uh, and just, you know, create great will in the community. Um, and so with that, I want to hand over now to Keith. Um, Keith, it's so great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know that my, uh, my community here are going to get so much value from you. So over to you, sir. Thanks, mate. James, thank you so much. Um, you know that anytime you reach out to me, I will always be there. And I'm glad I was able to be here today for you and for your folks here on the... Ah. On the well, that was, I guess, very positive. I, I love that? that. Someone was just giving you a very, very like, oh, I feel the love. <laughs> Beautiful. I'll take it. Um, look, <clears throat> I think that we're sitting on every one of us, um, perhaps one of the greatest opportunities life has ever given you. Um, this morning, I was just speaking to some of my Italian family. I, I'm both Italian and American. My father and his family are all born in Italy, and they're going through quite a crisis over there. So I don't want to diminish the sacrifice, the pain the difficulty that so many people and so many families are going through around the world. But that said, I do believe fundamentally we have an opportunity in front of us as a society that starts with you as individuals to reboot the world. And I, and I, you know, I, I really think this is where we are. We're at a place where what each of you chooses to do after this hour that we're going to be together uh, can begin a ripple effect of rebooting the world around us. I think, I think a lot of us have debt in our lives. And I don't mean financial debt, although maybe you do. But we have lots of debt, things that we have gone unattended to, swept under the rug, paid less uh, attention than we should. Um, the young lady that was just speaking, uh, who was talking about the the dearth of goals in her life right now, um, I might typify that as dream debt. I mean, there, there's have, have we taken our time to develop and to create the dreams? Yesterday, <clears throat> I realized something. The, these weeks that I've been here in my home alone and the uh, time that I have been uh, thinking about the reboot of my own business um, provides me a bigger question, not how do I help my business survive this or, or thrive through this. I actually have the opportunity to ask myself, what do I want to be doing in 10 years from now? And how is this time an opportunity to redesign my professional life? I don't think any of us, while we've all been on the habit trail, uh, that hamster wheel. Um, I don't think any of us have had such a gift than to really look with a white sheet of paper and ask ourselves, what are we going to do next? The world has stopped and waited for each and every one of us to figure this out. And with that, we've been given the greatest blessing of time without the fear of what's missing out, the FOMO of the rest of the world moving on and the things that you think you need to be at. You are right here present, trying to understand what your dreams are. I believe that we have lots of other forms of debt, and I'm going to go through a number of them today. I want to talk about our family debt and how our relationships are with the most intimate people uh, in our bloodline. But I want to also talk a little bit about the family that we choose, not just the family that we've been born into. Um, I want to talk about the team debt that we may have the relationships and the strength and the loyalty of those around us and the individuals who are co-creating our futures with us. And I want to redefine in the process what team actually is. I'm going to talk a little bit about our business development debt. My first book, Never Eat Alone, had a great chapter in it. It was called Build It Before You Need It. Now, it's so easy to think that right now you need it. Scarcity kicks in. You're fearful of making the payments, whatever those happen to be, um, you know, I've got a very significant monthly burn of an organization that I care deeply about, and you know, the revenue of that doesn't look like it did at the first quarter of the year. Um, it's easy to think about picking up the phone and transactionally trying to find revenue. 
On the other hand, it's also exactly the time when you need to be deepening and building the relationships that truly matter, um, that will be available to you for co-creation and revenue for a lifetime, not just today. And you and this vulnerable crisis of an opportunity has given us that chance to develop those relationships. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I even want to talk about your fitness debt. And I know that, James, you're such a focus on the body and wellness. And I've always admired your uh, your, your cohabitation of your focus on, on wellness, as well as your focus on business and how beautiful and powerful that is. But it'd be very easy for us at times like this to drink more, um, eat more, stay sedentary more. And I've been guilty of all of those things myself. Uh, and I need to reboot my fitness debt. Um, and the last thing is peace, peace and joy. Uh, how will we use this time to reboot our peace and joy debt that we have? And what are the practices we might use? So that's a guide, a roadmap a bit through what I'd like to take us through here today. Um, every one of these, I thought about it, you know, where do I want to focus? But, um, you know, I don't get many opportunities to sit and just chat, uh, in this medium and form. I'm usually turned on by a topic that somebody has given to me, and I'm off and running on this book or that audience or this whatever. But James gave me an open slate, and this morning, uh, in my meditative cup of coffee, I uh, I designed something that I thought would be beautiful for a group of extraordinary entrepreneurs. So, um, with that permission, and maybe I should even just pause and say that I'm very pleased. I'll open up a chat window. By the way, I've never done this either. In the middle of my talks, I'll open up the chat window and see if I can be guided a bit by what uh, what you all are saying. Is there anything that you'd like me to cover or focus on? Please throw it in the chat, and I'll do my best at uh, at communicating around those answers. At least just make sure it's it's uh, it's working for me. So somebody say hello. Somebody say hey. There we go. Got the hello and hey. Beautiful. Thank you. So let me start at the core. May I, may I tell you a little bit of a story about where I came from and why my mission is what it is? And I don't know why, but I'm, I'm sort of feeling emotional about this right now. Um, James, I don't know. I think it's your, your essence, James, that brings this out of me. It's beautiful. But um, I grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, my, old man was, my old man's family were immigrant Italians. And um, my dad was a steel worker. He busted his ass to make sure that he had the best living possible for his family. And then in the 1970s, everything crashed. Um, I got to tell you, it wasn't quite like this, but it felt like this to a family whose steel industry was crumbling around us. My father uh, lost his job. Um, nobody could get work. My dad would have to take the most menial work possible to just um, put money on the table. My mom had to become a cleaning lady and she hated that. Uh, I had to go and work myself. I was only, um, gosh, I was 10 or 11 or so. And I uh, went to work at the local country club carrying uh, uh, carrying golf clubs as a caddy, which by the way, changed my life, which maybe if we have a little bit of time, I'll tell you about it. But wind back a few years before the crash. Um, no, it was Latrobe, Pennsylvania. I didn't know. Uh, somebody was asking me if it was Oakmont. Um, Wind back a few years before the crash, my father, who was an ambitious and driven man, would come home. Uh, he was an ambitious, driven man without an education. Post-World War II, uh, just found himself lucky to have work in the United States, and, um, but, a, but, a, but a great American. And he really, really wanted to do his best. And he would come home and he would bemoan. He would, he would be sad that, that his his observations of the workplace were as messed up as they were. I mean, he busted his ass. And sometimes the managers in the steel mill would come to him and say, Pete, would you slow down a little bit? You're throwing off the peace rate, which meant uh, that the, because my father was working so hard, that the logged amount of work that he did was higher than his peers. And the managers would look bad because if one person was able to do more it would look like the managers weren't managing everybody effectively. So instead of getting everybody to do better, um, the manager would come over and ask my father to do less. And my father saw what was going on in the world of work and was so sad that his observations 
of what could have made that steel industry better were never asked for, were never open to, et cetera. And I made a commitment as a child that I would, I was going to be the governor of Pennsylvania. That's what a little kid knows. I mean, what the hell does a kid know that the governor can't do shit in terms of <laughs> making making society better in terms of commerce? But that was me. I was like, I'm going to be the governor of Pennsylvania someday, and I'm going to make sure that families like like ours don't have this kind of trouble ever again. Um, and that was, and that's always been my commitment. Today, I am so blessed. Uh, I am a uh, I'm a coach that focuses specifically on a niche. I coach executive teams through the transformation of their businesses. And um, we have been coaching this year uh, Delta Airlines. Uh, You could imagine the crisis and challenge that Delta is going through, one of the most extraordinary leadership teams I've ever had the privilege of working for. Um, General Motors, I have such admiration for what Mary and the team are doing. Uh, and have done and what they did coming out of bankruptcy and how how resilient that company is, such pride. Um, my dad was a UAW steel worker. Um, companies like Verizon uh, that uh, are trying to figure out how to meet and serve the world today um, because these phones of ours and the, and the network connections we have are so critical to what we're doing, particularly in an increasingly remote and virtual world that we're all living in right now. So this is what I do for a living. And I I have to pinch myself because that little kid sitting at the table of my dad's, you know, uh, dinner, I just couldn't even imagine, couldn't even imagine um, someday waking up and walking in and being of service to these folks. Uh, But, and, and so I am meeting my mission. It didn't happen through politics. It happened through my desire to have a dream and to stick with that dream. And Along the way, I didn't know the words that I wanted to use, but I'm going to tell you the words today that I would use to describe and that I invite all of you to, is that if you have a dream, your most important question you need to ask is not, what do I need to do? Um, Where do I need to go? How do I need to get there? All of those are important words, but we're all pretty good if we have a dream of putting a plan together. We're all pretty good at scratching, scratching out on a piece of paper a strategy. There's lots of folks that have taught us that along the way. But the missing and most beautiful question that I want you to ask yourself is who? Who? Who are you going to co-create your future with? Who are you going to embrace in a relationship that will allow the two of you and then the three of you and then the four of you And that if your dream is big enough, a movement of people to, and I'm going to add a new word to this formula, to co-elevate, not just collaborate, but commit to truly going higher together. You know, as you're sitting here today, you're given an opportunity, a space and consciousness and time to consider your dream and then begin to activate on those co-elevating relationships that will elevate you, those other individuals, and the world around you. Now, there's lots of stories I tell in my typical talks, which um, you can pull down any of my talks online on YouTube or uh, on Instagram at at Keith Ferrazzi. But I really want to go off script today for you, James. I, I, I really am blessed by your giving me this space, and I'm hopeful to those of you that are listening, that you don't mind this. This is new to me, by the way. I'm I'm being a bit vulnerable. Vulnerability is not new to me. That's my superpower. But what's new to me is this pace. Uh, It's a little scary to me. Um, I'm used to being on stage. I'm used to having, like, the Keith Ferrazzi that might have normally shown up here would be one that would be telling you exactly what you need to be doing in order to really achieve the kind of success that you have in your life. And, I mean, that is me. And that's not a fake me. That's just me. I get so energetic and excited about being of service to you. Um, But on this Sunday morning, I, I, it was interesting. I was yesterday, I was talking to one of my associates who's been with me for, oh gosh, 12 years, the company. And, uh, and I was having this kind of conversation with him. You know why? Because I could, 
what a blessing. What a blessing this time has afforded us to dip into true self. I mean, what mask is anybody expecting us to wear right now? I mean, the, the, the one thing that the one thing that I wish we would do, James, and hopefully you will do this, is, is I want you to tap into the authenticity and the vulnerability of where each of you is today. Um, I feel immense hope uh, for myself and for the world, for my business, but I also you know, have hit a revenue wall in, uh, in Q2 that I need to figure out what to do with and how to deal with, like everybody else in this world. I was talking to a dear friend of mine from, uh, from Vietnam, who's one of the most successful uh, entrepreneur restaurateurs, uh, somebody who I deeply love. And he, uh, you know, he's sitting on a lot of assets that he has to close down. And for a number of reasons, he can't lay off people. And he's just sitting every day watching his entire fortune that he's created in his life just tick down like sands in an hourglass. And he sees the month in which that's going to get to a point where it will be zero. Um, do, do people feel what I'm feeling right now? Do you understand that everybody on this call is faced with some level of fear and insecurity and challenge? Um, just raise your hand if you, you, you get it. Right. Um, and there's no shame in that. I think that's one of the most beautiful opportunities available to us right now. There is no shame and vulnerability because we are all there together. And, and this is such beautiful practice um, because today, more than any other time, you can begin to practice what I believe is the essence of co-elevation. So co-elevation, it's a formula. And the formula starts with the recognition that with and through people, you will achieve your greatness. And that the people that you invite in to achieve your greatness, I will, I'd like to have, I'd like you to listen to this intently. The first person you invite in to your team, you are inviting them into their team. The first person that you invite into your team, you are inviting them into their team. Co-elevation is, is an egalitarian philosophy. It's a philosophy that a leader isn't a leader on a pedestal, that a leader doesn't have to carry a burden, that the burden is shifted and dispersed among the team, that the people that you're inviting in to go and dream and grow and elevate together, that these individuals share together the burden and the dream and the possibility and the hope and the success. Um, I believe your leadership in a co-elevating world, which I believe is what we're rebooting to. At least we can. I mean, this world could go in one direction, I suspect. I guess it could go in a more isolated direction. It could go in a direction of fear and divisiveness. or each of you can join the movement and commit to activating, activating your co-elevating tribe with and for each other. And we can start that with nothing more than one to five individuals when we leave this hour that we have together, right? I mean, that's the possibility and that's the invitation. Um, the, the first step when we identify some essence of the dream we want to, to achieve is to then begin to invite people in. Now, what I want you to realize is that there's a lot of very frightened, frail, insecure, difficult, challenged, trepidatious people in the world right now. And the beauty of what you have to offer is you're going to take them from that isolated fear and that isolated sense of, I've got to figure this out alone. And you're going to invite them into a partnership. You're going to invite them into a co-elevating partnership where your energy, in essence, is going to be of service to them. And of course, that invitation is that they will be of service to you, but it's a, it's a collaborative engagement to co-create your future together, right? It's stepping off of that podium of leadership and, and into the network of people who are important to you. 
when I wrote Never Eat Alone, it was a book about networking. And as James suggested, I rebooted the word networking from this, what can I get from you, to a, a, a world of what, how can I serve you? And how can I authentically be with you? And, and with that, you created a tribe in your life, which will pay off dividends, significant dividends throughout your life. Um, and that is, it has been one of the most precious ways for me to live is creating and co-creating a tribe of individuals that are generous and loving and vulnerable around me. Now you can pick, pick different constituencies. And I want to do that with you, this, who are your co-elevating tribes? And I, and I start with that dream and then the creation of that, that identification of who that tribe would be. But no matter who those tribes are, you've got to lead with generosity because You've got to arrest the, that reptilian part of the brain that are making people more afraid than they were before. You've got to arrest that part of the brain and let people realize that they don't have to live in the 20 to 30 years of isolation that we've been growing into. The last 20 to 30 years has been a degradation of relationship and vulnerability in the world. The world has become more schismatic. The world has become more divisive. The world has become more connected, but less relational. Right? We have been more connected, but less relational. We buzz by our social media. We throw up a picture that is intended to impress. Um, and we're speaking in, as a broadcast medium, but there's this opportunity today to move from that. And we've, do, you, do, you, do you feel that? Do you feel that in the last 20 to 30 years, we have become more isolated, less, less relational, but more connected? Do you get that? So if that's true, this is the moment to reboot. It's one of the biggest blessings this planet has seen. I, I heard that the Pope uh, this morning caused for a, a, uh, a ceasefire of all antagonism around the world um, during this time of crisis. I, I, I hope that that's heard in a way um, that will be lasting and resilient. The, the generosity that you can lead with is to show that you care. So if we're going to get practical for a moment, I want you to identify some dream that you have or spend the today um, asking yourself, what dream could you create? You're a witness right now to my dream. My dream and my mission and my movement is that each and every one of you will achieve your dreams through the recognition and the act of embracing a way of living a way of living which is co-elevating with the people around you. And that with that co-elevation comes success, innovation. I mean, imagine this. With, with people deeply committed to a mission and each other, what they could achieve. All of the great movements of society have been born from co-elevation. They just didn't have a word for it. The civil rights movements, the movements of going higher together as a people, Right. You know, the American civilization, that great experiment that we had as Americans of going higher together, that commitment, that pioneer support that we would have in barn raisings. Right. This is the way that tribes were the essence of tribes. It's the essence of humanity. Seventy thousand years ago, when we were born onto the planet in tribes, we were in these tribes or we died. And, and in the last years. We've grown so isolated that we've become tribes of one or small pockets of tribes. And your ability to become something different is the key. So your first step is to get the essence of that dream. And my dream is that <clears throat> co-elevation becomes an operating system for the future. And that when people recognize that they have a dream, they realize they no need to go on a journey to co-elevate with a group of people around them. Once you start to identify who those people are and just make it easy, pick one today, pick one individual with whom you have an acquaintanceship, it might be a lovely acquaintanceship, but pick one individual that you would like to move from an acquaintanceship to a co-elevating relationship. Can you imagine who that person could be? Could you imagine who that could be? Could it be a client of yours? Could it be an associate of yours inside of your company? Could it be a dear friend who you admire for the success that they've created, but you've never really gone deep with that individual 
to open your heart and invite them to open their heart and to understand their struggles, their fears, their journeys, their dreams. It's, it's, it's one Zoom call away from a possibility. I was literally just talking to Eric, the CEO of Zoom, uh, the other day, and I, my opening was, thank you so much for giving us the, the system, the basis of technology to potentially save the world, along with all of the other individuals that have created this beautiful technology that allows us to do this, right? So I want you to, to pick an individual, and I want you to serve them. Serve them with your heart, serve them with your, your questions, with your curiosity, with your care, with your how can I help, what can I do for you, how are you feeling, right? You know, ask them whether or not they're struggling with their fears and concerns about their parents. My mom's an 89-year-old woman with asthma, and I found out yesterday, even though I put her on lockdown and I've got other people delivering groceries to her garage, they sit there for a day or two, and then she's allowed to pick them up. I mean, we're doing everything we can to keep my mother safe on the other side of the country. And I found out that she got antsy and got in her car and decided to go uh, get gas and go to the bank. And it just drove me crazy. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have my mother suffering from this virus and maybe worse across the country alone. And I couldn't get to her. And, you know, this is what people are dealing with today. What a beautiful opportunity to be there for someone. You know, the, the financial fears and struggles that people have. What a beautiful opportunity to be there for someone. If you lean in with that generosity and you lean in with that vulnerability, it then gives you permission to what? Let's go to the next step. It gives you permission to co-create. It gives you permission to hold each other accountable. That beautiful woman that suggested she needs some goals. Who in this tribe, who in this tribe of Jameses is going to reach out to her on a direct message and say, hey, dear, let me hold you accountable for you to think about your goals. And I would like to check in with you in three days to see if you've done it. What a beautiful opportunity. I'll give you a little tool that I use in coaching executive teams. I call it a 555. James, what I would love to see is your tribe of 30. You may already do this, by the way, James, and I know you, you probably do. But imagine this whole group of 30 divided into 10 groups of three. And you decided and agreed that every X period of time, every day, every week, every whatever, you're going to check in. And in nothing more than 45 minutes, the first five minutes, one of you is going to raise your hand and say, let me talk to you about some things I'm struggling with and I'm, I'm thinking about. I really could use your help with. Five minutes and you describe what it is. And then the other two individuals take five minutes and they don't answer your question. They just pepper you with, with questions to try to get you to self-discover, to, to, uh, to, for them to further understand. And then in the last five minutes, because they love you and they care for you and they want you to be successful, they're going to tell you exactly what they think. And by the way, you don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to do anything with it because they're being generous with their feedback. They're telling you that they think you need to get off your butt and do something. They're telling you that um, you're, you're being impetuous in terms of this relationship and you really should just forgive and move on. They're telling you whatever it is they're telling you, right? But they're telling you because they love you and they, they're going to leave that information with you to and analyze. They're not telling you you have to do anything. They're telling you what they think. And by the way, I wrote this new book and it's coming out in May. It's called Leading Without Authority. Leading Without Authority. Um, and James, if you want, uh, you know, I don't know, if those of you who have written books, you know that what my publisher has given me is a galley and it's for media and CEOs and that sort of thing. Um, James, I would be willing if anybody, because this book isn't going to be available till the end of May, if anybody wants to go get it at Amazon, feel free. Just tell James that you've gotten it and give him your address. And I will, don't tell my publisher, but I will send you a galley now so you can start reading it before you have the end of May. Um, and, and that's free. That doesn't cost anything. Um, so the leading without authority has the principle that all of us in our lives need to co create our futures with other people because it's most leadership feels that the burden of inspiration and the burden of innovation a burden of breakthrough thinking comes from our brilliance and it couldn't be further from the truth um 
one of my dear friends, and, and James knows him, Peter Diamandis, who wrote the book Abundance, and he's the founder of XPRIZE and Singularity University. He's a great guy to follow if you haven't. He's, he's probably one of the most exponential technology thinkers and science thinkers of what's the future uh, in, in exponential technology. He's one of my best buddies. And um, Peter matches me with, he knows where the world is going, and my job is to coach people to come together to achieve those things. So I coach Peter's team and Peter uh, is my coach personally and I'm his coach and, and it's just a beautiful relationship. By the way, there's no economics there. We're just lovely co-elevating friends. He is a member of my co-elevating team, right? And we both dream together. We are both committed to each other's success. We both serve each other constantly. We are constantly, you know, there are parts of our brains that, that are reserved for even when we're not around each other, we're thinking of ways we can be helpful to each other, right? That's what you need in your life, right? And, and Peter kicks me in the ass. He holds me accountable. And, and your leadership requires that you step off of that podium and allow people to kick you in the ass you know, and invite people to hold you accountable and, and invite people to give you feedback and development. You know, I think about co-elevation as a formula of two things. It's a formula of co-creation, you know, collaborating together to break through the most innovative ideas, and co-development. Co-development is a commitment from two individuals to be seekers. Um, one of my dear friends is a pop star. And uh, I was talking to him this morning, and he's, I, God bless him, he's had quite a life, as you can imagine. He's been a pop star since he's been in his teens. Um, and he's now 30 some and he's not, he's never been a seeker. He's never been a seeker. And one of the things I've tried to bring to him is the p- potential that we've got to constantly, which is why you're here. I know I heard some of you saying, I couldn't get your, I couldn't get our friends here. And you're bemoaning that. And you were like, well, I, you know, I, um, uh, you know, I wanted to send a, a, n- a note to some of them saying, no, 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 you know, you really missed something amazing. Let me make it a, let me give you a different way to reach out to them. Why don't you package three glorious nuggets of insight? And why don't you call them and say, I'm so sorry you couldn't make it, but I love you. And here are three things I took away that I think would be beautiful for you if you're interested. And if you want, we could get on a Zoom call together and we could really talk about a couple of the journeys that I had in my head and the awakenings I had in my head. And I would love to just sit and be present while you process that because you couldn't make it. You know, I went and I spent hours at this and I got so much out of it. Would you like to spend a half of an hour with me? And I'd love to be of service to you. That's the way you take this and invite somebody into a co-elevating relationship, right? And then when you start to understand those dreams and share those dreams with each other, right? Then you begin to hold each other accountable. You go on the march. And it's so important to realize you will never, you will never, never, never come up with great ideas on your own. You'll come up with the germination of an idea. But the, the formation of that into a plan happens in co-creation, right? I believe in diversity and inclusion. The diversity and inclusion that believes that only through diverse opinions and diverse mindsets and diverse backgrounds, um, and, and, but only through that with the unleashing that into an inclusive environment where people's voices are heard. Many of you are leaders of organizations. and. You may have teams that you're not hearing their voices. And as a great leader, it's so important. One of the great lessons that I bring to CEOs and leaders in the teams that I coach is walk into the room, and I'm usually with them, and I want you to pause and I want you to ask your team what you need and what you could do um, to make this team better. In fact, you might phrase it and say, I believe you care about our mission, and I do believe you care about me. If you care about the mission and you care about me, would you please tell me what I could do to be a better leader for you? And have them write it down. Give them 10 minutes to write it down. And when they write it down, I want you to have them pass it in. Usually for me, since I'm their coach, they pass it in to me or pass it in to somebody trusted. And then I want all of them, without, without attribution at the beginning, I want you to read them out loud. And then as a leader, I want you to listen to them and don't react because some of them in your mind won't be accurate or they won't be fair, but they're all generous and that they cared enough to share. 
And then what I want you to do is I want, after the end of that, I want you to say thank you. And I want you to say, I may or may not agree with everything, but thank you so much for your courage and for unleashing your point of view. And I would like to pick one thing that I'm going to start working on. Here's what it is. Thank you. And I, and I and say to them, I apologize if it wasn't what you wanted me to pick, right? But I'll, my, I will get to that. This is what I'll pick. And I want you to hold me accountable for, for doing that, right? Now, candor is so important in a co-elevating team. And, and feedback and, and that kind of wrestling together to go higher is so important in a co-elevating team. But we don't have enough of it. We don't have enough of it in our lives. Our friends tell us too often what we want to hear. Our team members tell us what we think we're wanting to hear. Please, please, as leaders, and, and again, leaders without authority, positional authority are irrelevant. Your, your leadership is your desire to have a vision and a mission and, a, and, and, and to enlist others. You know, Martin Luther King was given no leadership position. He, he earned leadership, right, through a strong mission and a vision and the enlistment of others, just as you need to do every day you walk into your companies, as you need to do every day you walk out into the world and enlist partners and clients in your mission and vision to co-create a movement. I think that all of us coming out of this, I want each and every one of you in, the, in, in, this, in this talk to be a movement leader. Leading without authority and co-elevation is your permission to be a movement leader. And your movement could be as, as precious as having a stronger family than it is today. And your movement could be as significant as reinventing a social, uh, you know, a, 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 a social um, state of being that you want to change. I don't care what it is. It could be anything. It could be the development of your product. But think of yourself as a movement leader. Think of yourself as a movement leader inviting people in. Um, look, I mean, any of you want to go deeper on leading without authority and how do you be that kind of leader as I, I've given you the permission to, to do so. There's lots of YouTube clips. I've got a lot of stuff up at, um, um, at, uh, at Instagram and you, and, and on YouTube, if you just look, look at co-elevation, I, I want to get back to the debt piece for a second. Um, we've been talking a bit about how do you, how do you reboot your dream debt? Um, I want you to invite a couple of people, like I mentioned before, in, you don't have to have your dream sharpened. You just have to have some good questions, right? For me, I've been asking myself, you know, I spend so much of my time running around in airplanes all over the world. I've got clients, got one client who is one of the Russian oligarchs <laughs> in, in, in Russia. Um, you know, one of the five big Russian oligarchs is one of my clients which is a little scary sometimes, but um, um, I'm never stopping. And what I've realized in the last couple of weeks is what a blessing it is to stop and to think and to nurture. And I, and I look at myself 10 years from now and I want that in my life. So that means I have to build a business that allows me to stop. And that means that I need to create a more scalable product other than me and my time. Now, I love how precious the time is that I get to spend with some of the most influential and powerful leaders, helping them co-elevate. I mean, the, the CFO of General Motors told me once that this philosophy of co-elevation was one of the primary reasons they didn't go back into bankruptcy after the bankruptcy. And I was, I, I was bawling. I mean, my dad, as I said, was a UAW steel worker. And that, you know, being told that, that I remembered. And I just, that just all came around. And I just remembered that little boy who's 10 years old, sitting, listening to his dad and realizing that there was some little boy somewhere in the, in the, in the system of hundreds and thousands of millions of families that would have been impacted by General Motors going under at the time that wouldn't, it wasn't going to have that problem because of what I promised I would do when I was 10 is to grow up someday and be of service to those kind of, those kind of companies and to save those kind of families. And that's what I'm doing today. Um, but that said, I want to do less of that with more precious audiences. One day I want, when a new president comes to office, I would like to be called because I would love to come down and work with the cabinet to rethink how they co-elevate and how they think of co-elevation with the other branches of government. There's no reason. If we, if we have dreams and goals, there was a day when Tip O'Neill and, uh, and, and Ronald Reagan would sit 
and have a drink together. And they would, they would talk about the country that they both loved, independent of their political differences. There was a day when leading with co-elevation was a principle um, among certain individuals. And we can find that again. This is that beautiful reboot opportunity. And I want to be a part of that. And that's where I want to spend my time. Um, but that would require me to, to create a movement of co-elevation, to create other coaches who can take this methodology that we use today and serve clients and they can serve their clients. And that's the business that I'm having the beautiful opportunity to reboot right now as I'm sitting here. I, I woke up yesterday on a Saturday morning from, um, woke up at six, had my first phone call at eight. And, uh, I didn't leave my desk other than for a run, um, until, uh, 1030 when I went upstairs to have dinner. And that's the energy that I have behind rebooting how I'm serving the world and the dream that I can create and the business that I can create in this new world. Um, and how I'm solidifying the methodology so it's no longer a Keith Frazzi art form, but that other people can follow that methodology. And I'm writing another book on this topic. Well, co-elevation is birthed and leading without authority. I'm, I'm writing more. I'm going to begin to create a masterclass. Um, and, and I'm just changing my life that will allow me to scale. And hopefully, you know, as, as I've always thought of, the reason God put us on the planet is because I feel like every one of us has an obligation to maximize the footprint we've left here and the ripple effect in people's lives that we've left here. Um, let's talk about family debt. Um, I'm sure that, look, all of our families are a little screwed up, particularly the more extended you get. And, um, and, and yes, I am, I am inviting coaches in to learn our method. Somebody just asked me. I'm inviting coaches in to learn our method. I have uh, coaches inside of Frosty Greenlight today that do this um, to the very large organizations that we work with. But I want to begin to serve smaller companies. And I am going to be creating a coaching system that will allow other coaches to learn this methodology, yes. Um, and it isn't available yet, but if you want to join the movement, um, reach out to me. And in fact, do me a favor. And, and that's how I, I guess I, what I'd say, James, is um, if you don't mind inviting your folks to also join my movement, because I, James, am a part of yours. Um, and if you do reach out to me on Instagram, I guess is probably the easiest way for now. And just say, I'm in, I want to join the movement and maybe talk a little bit about what you think that could look like. We'll, we'll activate it maybe a little bit later, James. We can chat a little bit about it. Yeah. But I want to talk about family debt. Um, family debt for me has been making a commitment to be the co-elevating coagulant, the bringing together of my family. And that requires me, there's a wonderful, uh, chapter in the new book, leading with authority it says it's all on you. And James, I think you recognize this in the 12 steps. Um, we have to recognize, and I've learned so much from the 12 step methodology. Um, the Dalai Lama, James has probably told you, the Dalai Lama said that the 12-step methodology was God's gift to society in the last uh, 200 years. Um, God's greatest gift to society in the last 200 years. What a beautiful way to phrase it. Um, the recognition that all change around you starts with you. The resentments that we've had with people that have hurt us in the past have bred behaviors on our part that have, have allowed us to show up not as our best selves. And so the amends that you think other people need to make to you, it starts with you making an amends to them. Let me say, say that for a second. The, when somebody harms you and you don't show up in your best self, the way to begin to repair that relationship is that the amends is for you to make to them. And you don't need them to make an amends back to you. I have, a, I have two foster children. And my boys are 21 and 25. Now I got them at 12 and 16. And for many, many years, um, they were some of the most struggling challenges that I've ever had in my life. Um, spitting at me, you will never be my father. Um, 
pushing the love away that they really wanted for fear that that it wasn't real because it never had been in their lives. And at 12 and 16, there's a lot of conditioning to uncondition. Um, and it's still so there. Look, it's there in all of us. All of us have wounds in our lives from how we grew up and momentums that we we have from how we grew up that, of course, we have it among ourselves and other people who have gone through their wounds will have them in theirs. We've got to forgive. At no point in my life could I cross my arms and say to my boys, when you behave like my son, I will be your father. Well, actually, I probably did say that. <laughs> um, but I should, and neither should you. Nobody around you who uh, you need to show up in your life or want to show up in your life in a different way, can you expect them to show up and meet you halfway? If it's important to you, then you're going to show up 99.9% until they start to soften. And that might be your sister and that might be your mother. But your indulgence or indignance and your or your resentments, that's only killing you and it's only killing your relationship. You need to begin to open yourself to others. And one of the things I'd love for you to do is ask one person in your life. You don't even have to tell them, but I want you to find one person in your life today that you're going to forgive. You're going to let go. Just one person. And if you make that commitment today, you don't even have to do anything about it. You don't have to do a single thing about it. You just have to make the commitment to forgive them and go on a path to do that. Now, how do you go on a path to do that? Part of it is asking your tribe. Ask the people that you're inviting in on that Zoom call today to talk to you about this and coach you on how you could possibly forgive and move on. Ask your spiritual leaders. Read about it. You don't have to do anything other than say, there is a cancer in my life that I am causing because of my resentments towards somebody for whatever reason, whatever they did is irrelevant, but I want that cancer gone and I'm going to forget. Once you make that commitment, then you begin to take little actions. And maybe someday you will be magnanimous enough to engender a new relationship with that person or not. But it's so important because this is you know, the, the negative relationships in our life um, have a massively erosive effect on our psyche and our capacity to co-elevate with others, even the positive people. We can't hold on. We've got to be light. You've got to show up as light in the world to be the best co-elevator possible. You know, my, my pop star friend, I just kept saying to him, it's like, listen, you've got to be a seeker. You've got to show up every day of your life trying to be better. And the only person you can control and how to be better is you. And you can't even do that. You can just be forgiving. And by the way, let's put that one person out there as yourself. Let's first start by realizing this isn't tough. This isn't easy. It's tough. And, and you've got to forgive yourself for your frailties and not being able to forgive. But just make the commitment and go on that slow, beautiful journey with family. And be the coagulant that brings family together. A specific action that I've done recently is I've created a new family. I was sitting in a uh, in a ceremony in in Central America. It was a spiritual ceremony in Central America. I'm a born Christian, raised Christian. I consider myself Christian, but I also consider myself deeply uh, spiritual and caring deeply about and respecting everybody's faith and how they get to their sense of whatever grounds them, whatever take them higher. Uh, I was in a shamanistic ceremony in Central America. And, um, and I was looking around at some of the most beautiful souls. There was this young girl named Gabby who, you know, while other people were struggling through the ceremony, she was being a such beautiful service and so peaceful in, in the way she was serving and so selfless and so caring. And I looked And I looked at her and I said, um, what a beautiful daughter she must be. And I enlisted in my heart, her as my daughter. And she's getting married. Uh, unfortunately, her, her marriage got her wedding itself. I was going to go. I only met her that trip. And uh, I was going to go and I was going to be a part of the wedding in Mexico that was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago. Um, and little by little, as I opened my heart, 
look, I've, I've, been, I've enveloped two boys that were not born from, from me, two foster children, and I consider them my, my children. And I don't mean to be paternalistic about this. Um, they could be brothers, they could be sisters, they could be grandparents, they could be aunts and uncles, but they don't have to be related to you by blood to be your family. And I have now, I've now got a text trail of 15 people who I love so deeply. And we're all going to be celebrating Christmas together at my home. And it's my family. It is my new family. And I am so blessed. And I am texting them. And we are texting each other. And we're giddy. And we're loving. And we're vulnerable. And we're caring. And it's so beautiful. And I would have never had this opportunity in my life um, than than the time that we have right now. And each of you can create this. Each of you can create this. And it starts with that one person you're reaching out to today. Um, I was going to talk about team co-elevation. And, and again, it's in the book. You'll read it. And I talked a little bit about it. Um, business development um, and how you can begin to. You know, I, I have a list of individuals about 100 people long. That had 100 people long list who I am now on a instant text conversations with. Um, I reached out recently to the CEO of a very lar- large and powerful uh, retailer who I had spoken for, I've known for a number of years, and I've, I've, I've never coached his team, but I've always wanted to because I admire him so much. And you know, I didn't reach out for business development purposes. I reached out to connect intimately. How are you doing? How are you holding up? <laughs> These must be trying times. Um, I went out and I found some information online that I thought would be useful to him. And I sent it to him. Uh, I did two years of research. I did two years of research on the subject uh, of leading remote teams. And I published 25 articles in Harvard Business Review. You go to Harvard Business Review and type in Farazi, you'll see a ton of research. The other thing, actually, here's what I've done. I I put up a new website just as a resource center for being a remote leader. It's called virtualteamswin.com. Virtualteamswin.com. If you put it up on the chat line, people could see it. Virtualteamswin.com. There's tons of resources there um, that are free for you to help lead your teams in a virtual environment. Because I'm coaching these teams now virtually. I used to be physically there but now I'm coaching these organizations in Zoom calls. Um, some of them are using WebEx. Some of them are using Microsoft Teams, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, it's a very powerful engagement that I'm having with them. And it is as powerful. It, you've got to be different. The difference between leading a physical team and leading a virtual team is you've got to be very intentional. You can't get sloppy. And I get very detailed. There's a wonderful uh, webinar I did with company called LHH, Lee Heck Harrison, and it's, it's posted on the Resource Center, and it tells you how do you become a great leader of a, of a remote team. It's a great, it's a, it's a podcast that's up there. It's called LHH. I also am now going to be doing a standing um, uh, webinar every week with Fast Company, and I just did one with HBR, Harvard Business Review. So there's lots of resources up there. Um, but I'm sending those that those the, I, I'm generating resources and sending them to the people that I would like to co-create with in the future. I do not have permission to send a text to this gentleman, this retailer, tomorrow, and say, "Is there any work for me?" You know, that's leading with transaction. But I do have the permission to send a message and saying, "How are you doing?" And then following that with as much generosity as possible. And opening vulnerably, you know, hey, you know, so and so, it's calling Brian. Hey, Brian, are your parents okay? Right? I mean, we're all struggling with these questions and begin to create. I've got 100 people, and I literally walk off an hour a day just to send texts to people that someday I would like to co create with. And now is a beautiful time to lead with generosity and build deeper relationships. Right? Um, I'm sure James has this covered in terms of your fitness and wellness debt and that he's 
encouraging all of you. I've been finding some wonderful um, uh, resources online uh, to do that. I can, a um, uh, buddy of mine who's got a gym out of Philadelphia, his name is Gavin McKay. Um, he's been sending me links to his uh, at home workouts, which are fantastic. Um, there's a young man out of Australia um, uh, named Fraser Wilson. I think it's called Fraser Wilson Lift. And he's just got a lot of great body workouts, just body weight only workouts. Um, try to find him here for you. Uh, Fraser Wilson Lift at, at Instagram. Um, but you really can use this time to get fit. There is no reason that you couldn't emerge from this period of time uh, significantly fitter than you ever have. Um, I have been doing a, you know, a glass or two of wine a night, and I've been starting to look at that and ask myself, is that something that I want to continue to do? Um, James, I know your, your answer for that one. Um, peace. You know, what are you doing to meditate? Yesterday, you know, I go for long, I'm an aggressive meditator. When I learned meditation, I learned in a 10-day silent meditation retreat. It's called Vipassana, V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. It's a beautiful way to learn meditation. And you can learn about it at dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A dot org. Um, it's free. You go and it's a 10-day retreat and somebody's already paid for you to go. And when you're done, the, um, they say to you, well, this is how much it costs, a few hundred bucks. Uh, you can pay for the next person to go if you can afford it. It's a beautiful system. 10 days to learn meditation. It's gorgeous. And it's all over the world. Um, and yet I don't have a meditation practice. So yesterday I decided, here's what I'm going to do. I sat for a minute and I, and I said, I'm going to be proud to sit for a minute. And then today I'm going to sit for two. Tomorrow I'm going to sit for three. And I'm going to make that commitment. And that's something I can do. That's something I can do, um, and not and I'll do it beautifully, imperfectly. I'll do it beautifully, imperfectly. <sighs> Where do we go? We're approaching the time that uh, um, that I have with you, and I want to leave time for some questions. Um, when I thought about this this morning, all I wanted was to to be me, to be of service. And I wanted to invite you to join the movement. I've not figured out how to activate that. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that I will. I am definitive. And the way you activate it is easy. The way you, the way you activate it is to go and find your co-elevating partners today. And James, if you're not breaking this group into small groups of three, I implore you to do so. Use this beautiful Zoom technology, which allows you to do breakout groups. And at some point, just break into small groups of three and let everybody do a five, 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 five minutes talking about the things that you're struggling with, five minutes of questioning from the other two individuals, and then five minutes of really beautiful, candid advice that nobody has to take and all you do have to absorb because we love you and care for you, right? That's a beautiful way to start opening up co-creation. Um, if you do that, I, I'll give you a couple of other things. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of boys who um, uh, are YouTube um, stars. They're, they have 25 million followers. The boy's name is Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, Key, K-E-Y. Uh, they're adorable. They are just energized and funny and silly, but they're all very positive. It's all very positive stuff. It's great. And um, I met Collins, and I and, and he heard about this principle of co-elevation. He's in his early twenties, and he said, "Keith, what I would love to do is find a way to bring to my twenty-five million followers the principle of co-elevation and invite them to be lights of co-elevating in their peer group." Um, look, you've got friends at home. I bet you have friends right now who are at home who are bored, and you could activate that. What movement are you going to invite them into? How are you going to invite them into co-create? Or those who aren't bored, like yourselves, who are activated and energized, um, how are you going to invite each other into each other's movements? 
my mom used to have a group of ladies that um, she played cards with every month, the card club girls. And this group of ladies um, used to make extra food and bring it home when my dad was out looking for work so that my mom could pretend that she was stretching a nickel better than anybody else and we didn't have to eat welfare cheese when we were out of money. Um, that group of ladies had sat with each other on, on their deathbeds um, as one or the other passed away and they held out their hand and they played cards that last time. They've never canceled a card game in 45 years. And when my dad died, that group of ladies made sure that my mom got out and got out of the house every day until she was really ready to get out of the house. Um, that's co-elevation. That's co-elevation. And I want that for you. We want that for ourselves. And I want you to be the, the point of light, the acolyte and the evangelist to introduce this philosophy to the people in your life. You will not be exceptional at it. You'll be humbly frail and struggle through it like I am. But what a beautiful aspiration to be a leader. What a beautiful aspiration to launch that movement with the people around you, for them to see this in you as it resonates. Um, James, you're that. Thank you for this opportunity to be more me than I have typically been in the format of a video. It's another one of the blessings that this, um, that this time has given us. Uh, love you, James. And I do deeply appreciate your inviting me here today. Keith, thank you so much. That was a powerful and extraordinary uh, connection that you just created for all of us. And I want to thank you so uh, immensely for that. Uh, I want to uh, just open it up to my community now to share with Keith how that impacted you and to ask uh, ask any questions that you may have of Keith um, for the next uh, 15 minutes. Jason, go for it, mate. Unmute yourself, Jason. Jason, unmute yourself. There we go. There we go. There we go. Cool. Thanks, Keith. So much of what you just said just resonated with me massively. Um, it was really good to hear because so many of the thoughts that I have uh, were just solidified by what you said. Um, and I agree with so much about this is such a good time to change and being leaders and trying to uh, elevate everyone with you is just <sighs> such a great concept. Um, I, I have more comments than questions really. And, but one of my questions is related around people who refuse to, uh, self-elevate with you. Um, personally, uh, my mum, after my dad died, um, you know, I was there for my dad before he died and I had to disconnect in a certain way because I just could not find a way to try and elevate him from the bad place that he was in. He was an alcoholic and that's what killed him. Um, my mum is also an alcoholic who's never actually uh, admitted to it. Um, but it got to the point where I just couldn't try and elevate them anymore because it was affecting me and my family, my kids, my wife. Um, I'm still suffering that with my mum, but also with a couple of other really important people in my life. Um, can you comment on how you might do that? Um, it, it, and it's hard because, you know, you care about these people and you can see the pain that they're going through. So yeah. can you talk to that a bit? Letting go, letting go is a tool for co-elevation. Um, in that, I mean, I can speak to times when that was my only source of, of refuge with my sons. Um, letting go, including uh, asking my older boy to leave the home 
because of his self-destruction and destruction inside of the family. Um, and he was not ready to, um, to meet the expectations and the rules that he needed to, um, you know, in the house, he had been to jail three times and he kept, um, repeatedly, uh, going in that direction. Um, the key is that other piece, letting go and forgiving. Um, you know, we all want to change other people. Sometimes the only thing we can do is just hold space, hold space, hold light, love, care. Um, you know, if engagement is harming you or harming others, I've gotten to the stage with certain people in my life where I have learned how to engage, hold space, hold integrity, but not allow it to infect me. But it might not be possible for your kids to experience that, right? So maybe distancing your children physically from individuals is going to be necessary because your children don't have the ability to hold space. But part of it is that desire for you to forgive and for you to grow to the place where you might even be able to hold space with this person. Um, that equilibrium is going to be yours to, to figure out, right? But what you have to do is you have to stop being the antagonist of trying to change this person, to antagonize, to provoke, to insist, to demand, to, to impose, right? Uh, I don't think as, as many people know who have gone through, um, addictions, if, if somebody isn't open and willing to change, then they're not going to change. But the question is, who is right there standing next to them when they're ready? And that should be you. What happens if they're never willing to change? You just have to live with that. Go with Godspeed. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That's all. Um, Speech. Were you saying, was it you, Guy, or was it Connie? Guy, uh, Guy go for it, Guy. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Keith, for, for sharing that with us and, and being so vulnerable with us. I, I really appreciate that. Um, you were speaking about co-elevation, and it you know resonated with me a lot because I recently created a, a mastermind group um, for <coughs> real estate professionals, which what I thought to begin with was going to be a lot about business, but ended up being um, a tool for us to all really support one another in our growth, get vulnerable, um, and help each other reach our goals. And um, as a leader of that uh, virtual forum, it's over Zoom, I wanted to ask what your advice would be to someone leading those calls um, and any tips that you had to, you know, grow the entire team. I know you mentioned there was like the five, five, five exercise, but I don't know, either detailed or general advice. This, um, I studied, um, hundreds and hundreds of peer to peer support groups in writing this book. Um, AA programs, YPO forums, etc. Um, there is a pretty detailed formula in here i called them at the time lifeline groups and this book has evolved into this book over the years um my first book never alone was a huge bestseller it still has never stopped selling this book peaked and then didn't sell well because it was really detailed it's got a lot of detailed things you need to do and a system and a formula but somebody like yourself i think could extract a lot of very specific tips from that um, what I learned though, is not a lot of people want that much. <laughs> so I've moved, I've gone back to my format of writing, which is much more colloquial and simple and focused. And, uh, it's like, you need, you need to write books these days, like eating popcorn, um, not like reading a manual. So, but for you, I think the manual would be very impactful for anybody else. Just approaching this content for the first time, I think leading without authority would be a good one. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Who's got a question? Throw your hand up, Connie. And James, that offer, again, if, if any of your team members reach out to you and just and tell you that they've already bought the book online, get their physical addresses to me 
Yes. And I'll get those to my publisher, okay? Lauren actually already uh, has already bought it while we were on the phone. She said she just purchased <laughs> Never Eat Alone and pre-ordered LWA. Love your energy. I'm a coach and everything you're saying is completely resonating with me. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Kevin, who's so been... Get, uh, but get, but get her physical address yes. and then send them to us and we'll get, we'll get Gally's mail out to her. Yeah. Uh, Brenda Peterson says, Keith, you are so real and have such passion for serving others. The sincerity is beautiful. I would love to be involved in your next mission. Thank you. Um, reach out to me on Inst- You know, the other thing, either reach out to James and, and he can package these and I can get a reach out to you collectively or just on Instagram for now. But uh, the way uh, to do it is begin to activate this stuff. I think it's hilarious that you're saying to people, reach out to me on Instagram because Keith was the most social me- like anti-social media person for years and I remember putting him on my Insta story and he's like, oh, I, I don't want to be on your Insta story. I feel like a trained monkey. And now he's like literally Insta storing all the time now and inviting people to message him on Instagram. So what can I ask, what is the Instagram? Where can we find you on Instagram? Like what name do you go under? Is it just Keith Ferrazzi or what? Shirley you- Temple. <laughs> <laughs> at at Keith Ferrazzi at K E I T H Ferrazzi. Okay. E R R A Z Z I. It's a little blue checky thing. It comes yeah. up. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, who's been on uh, Kevin Schuweiler, who's been with me uh, on in my team for about four years and has served so many people who are on the call here and helping people to quit alcohol. Um, so it's just for context, Keith. Many people on here um, have been part of my Project 90 program, which helps them quit alcohol. Um, and many others have not, but uh, all are committed to being, you know, to have some level of, of alcohol freedom. Uh, and Kevin has just shared vulnerability, heart, and being a stand for, for, for this, um, uh, for us, uh, all to see a reboot, a reboot in so many ways. Keith, you completely moved me today. So that was feedback um, from Kevin. And Kevin, I'm not sure if you want to elaborate on that or I'll unmute you. If you might want to share with Keith, just unmute yourself. Oh, my God. Yeah, I was like tearing up as I see him over here. Just like I feel like I'm on the couch with him on Sunday morning. We're having a cup of coffee together and just hearing what's real in your life. Um, yeah, uh, like your books have changed me as well. I, but I would have never m- met James. I'm convinced of it if I had not taken advice from your Never Eat Alone. I don't know, James, if you remember, I reached out to you with an email, no strings attached. I just said, James, I love your podcast. I have some notes have been taken of your podcast. I just put them into a little form, little outline. If you want to put them on your website, go for it. Just being of service. And so I just want you to have that as feedback. For so thank you, Keith. You know, I, I've gotten, there's a couple, uh, Never Eat Alone is one of those blessings that the universe uh, God gave me to be able to serve. And it's almost like if that, if that's all I did, I'd probably be able to drop the mic and, you know, pass into pass, pass off into, into the next, next space. But, um, then to have come along and had the blessing to be of service to companies like General Motors and the way that I have and others that I work with, uh, has been extraordinary. And, you know, I'm 53. Um, I got a lot of life in me plan to live well above a hundred. And, um, I am so excited and I'm so excited about really touching the planet in this particular way with these words of co-elevation. Um, it's so surprising to me that the, the word hadn't been created before. It's just such, such an obvious word for what we need today, going higher together as a tribe, as a community, as a family, you know, imagine it being the definition of a spousal relationship. Right, that that's what few people need to do. I married a couple not long ago <clears throat> over New Year's Eve, and um, the whole sermon that I gave, the sermon as a as the as the officiant, uh, was about this couple co-elevating with each other, and how the community would come together co with them. It's just so powerful, and I really hope that it catches fire. Uh, I really do. Hey Keith, I have a question. That's Mark. Uh, I actually saw you speak. Probably 2007. It was a long time ago, and it was high impact then. So it's great to see you again. Um, I love the idea of like the hundred people that you keep like a text dial yeah. going with. 
who may be the future opportunities of people to build relationships with over time. Uh, obviously, that's an f- efficient way to communicate, but not a personal way to communicate. How do you think about the time that you dedicate to kind of text-based relationships versus picking up the phone versus... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me know. To- <laughs> Those hundreds of people are all being individually texted by me. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. But yeah. uh, and it's still not I, the same as picking up the phone or meeting someone in person. How do you how do you just think about the time that you spend yeah. the different levels of intensity of relationship and communication? Yeah, yeah I, I teach this and I taught this in Never Eat Alone and Who's Got Your Back. I, I, I did I designed something called a RAP, a relationship action plan. And a relationship action plan identifies what you're trying to achieve in your life. And then by category of what you're trying to achieve, you list the names of the people. And then, um, you know, my family list, that, that text group of people that are coming to Christmas, that's about my heart, right? That's about living joyfully with the kind of people that I love. Um, the hundred names that are on the text trail who are leaders in the world today, um, that's about my service. Right. I want to be of service to them. I really my my I live I live life to be of service to the people who serve others. And so that's what I do. Um and but some of them are A priorities, B priorities, and C priorities. Right. And so you spend disproportionate time with the A's. And it's okay to say that because it's just what we do. We spend disproportionate time with our kids versus other people's kids. So that's an A priority versus a B priority. But if you don't get specific, if you don't put a plan together, the other thing that I do is I actually list what's called an RQ score. What is the relational quality that I have with this particular person? That retailer CEO that I was talking about, you know, that person's a three to me on a scale of negative one, which is for some reason, it's been a strained relationship. Zero, they don't know me yet, all the way to a five. And a five would mean, you know, I could call them with a problem on the weekend, you know. Typically, anybody that I'm texting has to be at least a three, right? You know, zeros, ones, and twos, you can't get there. But I'm trying to move a three to a four, right? And some of them I'll never move to a five, and that's just okay. Um, But you need a system to think about the relationships of your life and how to more effectively manage them at scale in order for you to scale your life. If you're, if you do believe that who is a, is a door to opening your transformation and the transformation of the world around you, you've got to get good and systematic about the who. And it doesn't mean inauthentic. Every single text I'm leaving is deeply authentic. Now you just say something, which I'm just going to end with. Um, you know, I think there's still a piece of me, despite what I do today, and the successes I've had, I think there's still a piece of me that probably doesn't feel worthy of asking that retail CEO to a Zoom call. So I think I'm challenging myself as I'm sitting with you because I figure that the most powerful people in the world, I have the permission to text them and I'm blessed that they're texting me back and we're exchanging and I'm being of service and I'm sending them information. But I'm not asking more of that in those relationships. And maybe I need to. Maybe I can't. So maybe I need to take a group of those and to think about moving that to video, which I think could be very powerful. So your question was very helpful to me. Thank you. I'd like to offer something. Um, I like to send uh, video text messages to people as opposed yeah. to just written text. And I'll, I'll give you just an example. Keith is speaking here. Um, right now on this call, which is amazing and terrific. And um, whenever I have something that I feel is of, you know, importance or significance, I always try to send a video text. And I'll, I'll show you. I was, went for a run a couple of weeks ago and I literally was shirtless and sweating and, you know, had the gratuitous self, you know, shirtless. Um, By the way, James... James thought that that would be more enticing to me. That's why he did it. He was <laughs> leading with generosity to show his chest. <laughs> and, uh, and I just went, you know, I'm, I'm just going to send him, send Keith a video text. And, um, you know, I did, I sent him, sent him a video text and I invited him to come and share his gift with us all on, on this call. And, 
you know, graciously and beautifully um, Keith, Keith agreed. And so I would just say this to everyone and also offer this to you, Keith, I'm not sure if you're doing this, but I found there's immense power in video text messaging as opposed yeah. to just written text messaging. When it's a video, people can see your heart. They can see your mannerisms. They can see your body language. And, and Tony Robbins is always going on about the fact that um, – uh, communication is only 10% what you say and 90% of how you say it. Genius. Can I just reinforce that? I don't, and like, for you, I would have probably done it anyway. But the, the e, if it had just, it, if it had come in an email, I might not, it wouldn't have even gotten to me because my team screens my emails. Um, if it came in a regular text, I might have forwarded it to my team and said, you know, does this make sense for me? Right? Um, the fact that you sent the video, you know, it did remind me how much I care for you and how I am committed to you. So, uh, yeah, good advice. And I'm going to start using that with, I'm going to, I'm going to be chewing up a lot of bandwidth because of you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Keith. I want to be so, I want to be so conscious of your time. It's the bottom of the hour here. Um, so look, I, what I'd love, love to do is, um, I'm going to take a screenshot now. If anyone doesn't want their image used in this screenshot, just press stop video, but I want to have Keith in it and I'm going to share, send it to Keith and, um, and also, in, and send it to all of you and invite you to just share it on your respective social media and just tag Keith Ferrazzi. Uh, mm -hmm. Add Keith Ferrazzi on it, um, and just say, you know, I'm I'm here to co-elevate together. And if we've got, you know, 35 people here sharing this, I mean, not everyone wants to do it. So let's just say that most of us here are going to share this. What an amazing, really generous. Thank you. Yeah, what an amazing That's way true. to get Keith's message out into the world to show, to have like this this visual proof. Can, you, can I ask one more favor? Yeah, I'm searching for somebody to help me with social media. You talked about social media. Um, I have never, as you know, I've never maximized it. You know, I've, I know what I've got on, cause my audience, I've always thought like, why do I need this? My audience is, there's like 500 people in the world that are the people that I sell to and work with, right? There's very few individuals, but now in this new world that I'm moving into to be a broader service, social media is important. I don't, I would love to get some support and help. I'm trying to find somebody that I can enlist to hire to really run my social media um, in an incredible way that would passionately believe in my content and understand it, et cetera. Um, so if anybody knows of anybody, I would love to, to get some recommendations or mm. some, some thoughts. Yeah, I've got a couple of people in mind, and I'm going to ask Ty Lopez when he joins us this afternoon on the call as well, who he works with and who he can recommend. Well, Ty is an, Ty's an animal. Yeah. Ty has like, he has an army of people have probably like half of them are volunteers and whatever give time i love uh I, I i was watching him the other night and i was just mesmerized mesmerized by his talent he is so extraordinary and engaging in this medium uh, i'm just so new at it um yeah all right everyone if, uh, if everyone's ready for a screenshot here i'm going to take this screenshot and i'll send it to people here we go one two three big smile throw your hands in the air let's go one two three I love it. Okay, great. So I'm going to share that um, that image with you, Keith, and with all of you as well. And if you'd like to, you know, share that on your social media and tag at Keith Ferrazzi and Co Elevate. Um, let's see how many people we can reach with our respective social medias, and a great way to to get Keith's message out into the world. Keith, thank you so. Thanks much. for spending your time. I appreciate your time. So appreciate you yeah. being here and connecting with us. Bye, everybody.